Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Give me a great pleasure to introduce the 2015 Shedar Prize recipient, Dr. Jonathan Mackler, who is another one of the many Shedar success stories in which the person starts out as a student and eventually rise through the rank, you might say, and ends up all the while making great contribution to astronomy and space physics. Jonathan uh, received his uh, bachelor's degree from Cornell University in 1999, and under the mentorship of uh, Dr. Mike Kelly, he received a PhD from Cornell in 2003 with a dissertation relating GPS plasma density observation to the phenomenology of equatorial and mid-latitude plasma bubbles. During this time, he was a member of the CEDAR steering committee from 2003 to 2006. Following Cornell Graduate School, Jonathan worked at the Naval Research Laboratory as a postdoctoral fellow, NRC associate, I believe, for two years and became then a faculty member of the uh, University of Illinois Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He received tenure and promotion to associate professor in 2011 and promotion to professor in 2014. Jonathan had received several awards during these years. The Matt Van Valkenburg Early Career Teaching Award from the IEEE Education Society, and in 2008, the Zelzovich Medal from COSPAR for his innovative experimental observation and studies of the growth, structure, and drift of ionospheric irregularities. Beginning in 2008, we started working together and doing research on the thermospheric dynamics of the equatorial mid-latitude region. Over the course of Jonathan's career as a CEDAR scientist, Jonathan has compiled a very productive record of publication, 85 in number to date. Today we will hear from him regarding the FabiPro Nation Network research that culminated in the JGR paper published in August 2014. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Jonathan Mackler at the 2015 CEDAR Prize winner. Um, all right, so thank you. As John said, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the work we've been uh, conducting over, actually it's probably the past 10 years or so that I've been working with John, um, trying to develop a, a comprehensive uh, network of Fabry Pro interferometers to study the low and mid-latitude uh, thermospheric dynamics. Um, and as I was preparing for this, I went back and I looked at the uh, papers that we published on this uh, on this topic and made one of these little word diagrams. So these are all the, the various co-authors um, I've worked with over the past um, 10 years uh, on, on, on this topic. And you can see, of course, the big name there. Um, I, I really wouldn't have done this work um, without, without the, uh, the mentorship of John. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about, about CEDAR is that uh, young scientists are able to, to work with the, the more senior, uh, senior and seasoned scientists and uh, make our own contributions uh, under the mentorship of, of some really fabulous scientists. Uh, this doesn't show you know, the, the mentorship I got at Cornell from Mike Kelly, Paul Kintner, Don Farley, or why I was at the Naval Research Lab with Ken Diamond and Shanana Basu, but uh, really this, uh, for, the, for the students out there, this community is rife with, uh, with senior scientists that are, are, are more than happy to take you under their wings and, and bring, you, bring you along. Um, so, as John mentioned, my, my PhD work was, was more study, more, more focused on ionospheric irregularities using imaging and GPS. And um, as I was transitioning from the PhD world to the postdoc world to the faculty world, I was looking for, for new and exciting things and exciting places to go. That's another great thing about this, this field. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that really came to, that struck me was that we've, we've studied quite a bit about um, the plasma, and we have lots of measurements about the plasma, but really the measurements of the, the neutral atmosphere are, are lacking um, to, to a large regard. Um, and really this, this comes to what, what the importance of wind measurements are and why do we need to know something about the thermospheric winds. And it's really that, that the winds 
um, are, are, are critical in, in terms of moving, um, transporting mass, momentum, composition, um, energy throughout the atmospheric region. Um, and not only the, the neutral aspect, but through collisions and drag, uh, the plasma and the ions will interact with one another. And so these dynamo-driven fields uh, and current systems um, will actually be, be paramount in forming uh, what we see in, in the ionized plasma that we can measure through a variety of radio uh, remote sensing techniques. Um, and so really, if, if you're not looking at the, the, the neutrals and only measuring the plasma, you're missing a large part of the story. Um, and, and I think I came to realize early on that what, what, what we needed were, were more measurements of, of the elephant rather than just the trunk, trunk or the tail of the elephant um, from that standpoint. Uh, the difficulty was that even though these, these neutral winds are so important, they're, they're difficult to measure. Um, radio sensing techniques really don't work. Um, you, you have to rely on either in situ um, accelerometer measurements or on um, or on remote sensing techniques, optical, optical techniques. Um, and so compared to our, our, our knowledge of the plasma and, the, and the, the, especially with the proliferation of GPS systems, the, 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 the wide ranging measurements we have of, of the plasma field, uh, the plasma state, uh, we, we really were only getting about 1,000 measurements of the neutral winds uh, globally every day. And if, if you really want to understand spatial and temporal variability, that's not enough measurements. Um, and so, um, we, if, if we want to understand the dynamics, we, we we're going to have to do something. We're going to have to put out more, more measurement systems. Um, and, and this would hopefully overcome our inability of, of modeling and understanding the, the coupling and driving effects of the thermosphere on space weather. So th this sort of motivated, I, I went back and I looked at the proposals I've written over the past decade, which if you've never done, if you've never looked at a proposal you wrote 10 years ago, it's, it's actually a kind of humorous thing to think about what you thought you were going to do 10 years ago and what you actually ended up doing along the way. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fun exercise. Uh, but I went back and looked at some of the, some of the things we, we said we were going to do. And actually, to, truth be told, we, I think we've made progress in each of these, each of these areas. I'm only going to talk about a few of them. Um, but at, at, a, at a very low level, we wanted to deploy these FEVI probes um, in networks, especially, uh, to characterize the base state of thermospheric dynamics. So, so what, were the, what were the neutral winds doing? What were the temperatures doing um, at, at various latitudes um, as a function of time? Um, and there were some indications that, that really the climatological models that, that, we were rely, that the community was relying on um, weren't really up to speed. Um, they, weren't, they weren't doing a good enough job, especially as you start thinking about some of the models and trying to go towards real day-to-day -day variability type. The, the, the climatological models at the time just weren't there. Um, and then also you needed these measurements to validate those more advanced uh, first principle models or similar models. Um, and we just didn't have enough measurements to do that. Um, we also, uh, also made a lot of statements about wanting to understand thermospheric ionospheric coupling at low latitudes, so the drivers behind uh, ionospheric irregularities at low latitudes, um, and then also studying the F region dynamo um, and the role that that plays um, at lower latitudes. Um, and then there is also a, a nice engineering side of things where if you were deploying a, a network of these observ observatories, this would give you uh, some new engineering things you could do, some signal processing to uh, take multi-site observations and turn those into maps of, of the dynamics. Um, and so really to use those engineering type viewpoints to study the spatial temporal dynamics required not just a single site anymore. We had to deploy multiple um, multiple uh, instruments to be able to give us a larger field of view than you can actually get from a single location. And then finally, uh, as we've started moving towards mid-latitudes, uh, we wanted to take a look at the response of the thermosphere to geomagnetic storms. And I'll, I'll end my talk talking, discussing some of the things we've learned about that over the past um, three or four years. So if you look at, um, excuse me. If we look at what the uh, state of the Fabio Pro world looked like in 2005 when I started working with, uh, working with John, uh, this is what I could find in the CEDAR database. These were, these were the sites that, that we have in our, our database going back to 2005. Some other sites come on and off uh, as you go back historically, but really it's, it's a very sparse, sparse network. Um, clearly, everything is going to be operating individually. Yeah, we do have measurements at the different latitude regimes, but really nothing to really speak towards long longitudinal variability and the like. Um, I actually first met John 
I think it was around 2000 or so, he had gotten money to, uh, to put together an imaging system and Mike Kelly loaned me out to uh, develop some of the software for him. And I think that imager was stolen. Someone broke into his, his, his observatory and stole the image and Clemson, being smart that they are, they insure all their instruments. So John took the insurance money and developed a new in, in, uh, imaging interferometer. And that was the interferometer that we've been using in, in, this, in these experiments over the years. Um, and so having met John to do the imaging work, um, he started talking with me uh, in, around this time frame about maybe collaborating and, and co-locating imaging and interferometers um, around the world. And so 2005 was also around the time of the 50th anniversary of IGY, and the UN had uh, uh, these programs where they, they were trying to hook up instrument providers from the first world with scientists from the developing uh, countries to try to put instrumentation, especially in Africa. So the first place John and I went uh, to, to look uh, for field sites was to the islands of Cape Verde. Um, and John and I actually traveled there to do some site visits, and we found some potential uh, potential locations to field some interferometers there um, at some weather stations. Um, but as it turned out, after we, we, we did our visit there, uh, there was an election, and all the contacts we knew in the science, scientific community over in Cap Verde uh, got replaced with new political appointees. So nothing ever came out of, out of that, uh, those field trips other than John and I uh, becoming fast friends and deciding that we, we really did want to take over the world with interferometers. Um, the next place we went, uh, 2009, uh, we refocused uh, into uh, deploying instrumentation in Brazil. And here we actually were successful. We, we brought some of our students down with us and we deployed uh, some interferometers. You can see the sky scanning system there under the dome um, in these trailer systems in, uh, in, in Kariri and Cajuziris and worked with uh, Ricardo Baridi, uh, a faculty member down at, uh, at, uh, at a university down there. And uh, those have been operating since 2009. Um, we then turned our focus to the mid-latitudes, and John installed uh, uh, imaging, uh, one of these imaging interferometers at uh, Perry. Uh, you can see here John standing in front of uh, a dome. Um, and that sort of formed the, the anchor of the uh, nation array, so the, uh, the North American Thermosphere Ionospheric Observing Network that we deployed and developed over the next several years. So 2012, we were quite busy. We deployed uh, with uh, Aaron Ridley up in uh, Ann Arbor actually Peach Mountain. Uh, this is the system we have operating in Urbana, and this is with uh, Marco Chioca, uh, Chiocha uh, at Eastern Kentucky University. Um, so we started to get this nice little network of four interferometers. Um, we had a fifth interferometer installed at Virginia Tech, uh, working with Greg Earle. Uh, in the following year. So this, this then, uh, combining them with our friends at Millstone Hill, we started to get quite a nice dense network of interferometers in, in the eastern portion of, of, of the U.S. Um, and then finally, 2013, we did, we did get back to, to Africa. Um, so we're, we missed a little bit. We ended up uh, in Morocco. Uh, but here are some of my students. We, we, we installed an interferometer up in the Atlas Mountains at the Okaidaman Observatory in, in outside of Marrakesh. Um, and these are some of our great colleagues uh, that we're working with in Morocco. Uh, this is actually the Minister of Education came out to, uh, to oversee the dedication of this, uh, this, this instrument. And we were on national TV and things like that. It was quite a kick. Um, so uh, even though we, we, we initially started here, we ended up a little bit to the, to the east. Um, but we, along the way, we, we populated some of, some of North and South America. Um, and so if you, look, if you look at the state of, of, of the Fabi Pro world um, now, and a lot of other groups have been deploying uh, interferometers as well. So if we take a look between 2005 and now, uh, there, there are quite a few more interferometers. I'll, I'll argue later on that this isn't nearly enough, but it's, it's a very good start. Okay. So just for those people that aren't familiar with, uh, with interferometer and, uh, and, and what we're measuring with these thermospheric um, instruments. Um, I'll, I just have a few slides here. Um, so essentially we're looking at the, the red line emission, uh, which uh, comes from the dissociative recombination of O2 plus um, and emits photons uh, typically in a layer at about 250 kilometers in altitude uh, with some, some width of maybe 50 kilometers or so. And with our interferometer here, we're measuring um, usually along uh, lines of sight at different elevation angles. Uh, our typical, we'll, we'll measure at 45 degrees or so. And so within this region, we have, uh, we have, we have uh, excited oxygen that will emit in the red line. 
And so if we take a look at that, uh, if everything were static, there was no temperature, there was no velocity, um, our interferometer would just measure a delta function um, at 630 nanometers. Um, that, that's, that's what that emission is. Um, but the, the atmosphere has some temperature, so all these, fo all these uh, molecules uh, or atoms are, are jiggling. And so that jiggling comes and gives a Doppler broadening to the, uh, to the red line emission. And so we get a, 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 a more or less a Gaussian shape whose width is proportional in some way to the temperature. Um, of course, the temperature and the motion, the, the, the thermosphere isn't just uh, moving with temperature. Um, it's also moving uh, in mass and bulk. So we have these jiggling atoms that are then also have some slow drift and some velocity. And so not only is that delta function at 630 nanometers broadened by temperature, it's also shifted in some way by the, the bulk motion. Um, and so really the job of the interferometer is to be able to measure that uh, spectra, uh, to be able to estimate the, the temperature of the atmosphere, and somehow estimate what that Doppler shift there is to give some measurement of what the velocity, uh, what the neutral wind is. So the instrument that John developed and that we've been deploying um, basically, actually counterintuitively, it, it reduced the Edelon aperture. Um, and so the reason for this was to make these systems smaller so that they were easier, easier to deploy and move around. Um, but of course, by reducing the aperture, you're going to reduce the sensitivity of the system. Um, that was compensated by uh, moving away from a, a pressure scanning device where you would be looking at the fringe pattern moving over time. Um, to, to measure that Gaussian profile, and backing it with a, a very high quality um, thermoelectrically cooled uh, CCD um, so that you can measure the actual ring pattern, and we increase the field of view so that we can get multiple orders of that interference pattern. And so that, uh, that opening up of the field of view, measuring these multiple orders, uh, compensated for the reduction in the aperture so that we could still um, provide a very good uh, signal noise ratio and get uh, high quality measurements. Um, and so we also then, uh, through uh, some, some good uh, signal processing analysis techniques, uh, were able to get quite small uncertainties on the order of five meters per second and 20 Kelvin estimates for our winds and temperatures respectively. And this can be done with actually quite short integration times. So we, we are able, uh, when the emission is bright, we are able to uh, obtain these uncertainties with about a 30 second integration time. Um, so this allows us to actually go after the dynamics of the thermosphere, which, weren't, uh, which wasn't really possible with, with previous instruments. Other thing you'll see later on in the talk is that as we start coming up with better estimates, we start to see things in the physics that people were able to ignore 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago because the instruments weren't providing measurements of high quality. Um, and so there's, there's devil in the details, of course. Um, in addition, we have this dual sky scanning mirror up top, which allows us to rotate the, um, rotate the field of view so that we can observe in any arbitrary um, uh, observation. And then finally, we have a frequent, frequently stabilized laser, and this is important because it allows us to monitor the stability of the instrument. Um, so we, we are able to take a look at that through the scattering chamber um, throughout the observing cycle and uh, make sure that we understand how the instrument is drifting, and it gives us a, a, a different way to come up with a zero calibration, which is important for, for interferometry to, to understand what the absolute Doppler shift is. Okay. Oh, pushing the wrong way. Okay, so in terms of the analysis, what, what we do essentially is we, we change this uh, two-dimensional interferogram, uh, we find the center of it, and we go through an annular summation to come up with a one-dimensional interferogram. Uh, we take the statistical property of all the pixels that go into this uh, interferogram to inform a, a levenberg marquardt uh, least squares fitting uh, to come up. When we look at the laser like this, this allows us to, uh, to estimate the instrument parameters that we need, uh, the gap size, the reflectivity, things like this. We then take those estimates and we feed it into our, our analysis when we actually look at the sky. So here you can see the laser, which is more or less a delta, gives us a very sharp image, whereas when we look at the sky emission, it, it, it broadens out, and that's because the, the atmosphere has a temperature. 
Um, but we use the parameters that we estimate from the, the laser um, as we then go and we do the analysis of the, uh, the fringe pattern here. And out of this uh, analysis here, uh, analysis here uh, falls out the uh, estimate of the Doppler shift and the broadening, which gives us our winds and our, our temperatures. Um, and then we also get estimates of the uncertainty of this. Um, all this is detailed in a paper written by one of my students and published last year. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at some of the results. Uh, and I'm just going to go through a few of these, uh, pointing back to the original motivations that, that we had for, for developing and deploying these instruments. Um, so this is uh, Brazil. Um, so we, we deployed in August of 2009, and we have basically a, a nice five-year um, set of measurements here from the same location. Um, these plots are as a function of local time and then day of year, and so each of these strips is one nights of observation um, going against this color bar right here. So these are our zonal winds, positive to the east, negative to the west. Uh, these are our meridional winds, positive to the north and negative to the south. Um, and so you can see uh, general trends. There, there is some yearly um, seasonal trends that we see each, uh, that we can see five bumps here in the zonal winds. Uh, more importantly, in the meridional winds, you can see the general trend of the wind blowing from the southern to the, uh, the summer to the winter hemisphere year after year. So you can see uh, the northward winds here during the local summer down in Brazil. It's a southern hemisphere site. Uh, and then the, the southern, uh, southward winds here in the local winters oscillating to and from. I had mentioned earlier that one of the, we, we, we were concerned about the, the status of the climatological models. You can, you can see this by comparing those measurements. So these are the zonal winds and the meridional winds compared to the HWM 93 winds. So these are the zonal winds and the meridional winds you get from, um, from that model, that climatological model. Um, and you can see the zonal winds don't look too bad. Uh, there may be a little bit of an underestimating, uh, underestimation, uh, uh, I'm sorry, overestimation of the uh, zonal winds in the early evening, uh, but it doesn't look too bad. Uh, same thing could be said for the meridional winds, where there's a little bit of an uh, underestimation um, of what the winds are doing uh, from the model compared to what we see in the actual data. But uh, the general trends, if you blur your eyes and, and sort of go out of focus, it's not so bad. Uh, the difficulty goes then as you look at HWM 07. So if you go back and forth, you can see there is quite a bit of change. And I would say the 07 updates, at least for the uh, sites in, in, in Brazil, uh, tended to look uh, a little bit worse uh, from the 07 update than they did in the 93. Um, so as we were taking these measurements, we started talking with John Ebert and uh, Doug Grob at the Naval Research Lab as they were doing their updates uh, for the HWM-14. And so they actually used our, our data from Brazil um, to, to improve the statistics that go into the, the HWM formulation. And HWM-14 has been released, and I'd, I'd argue that it does a much better job of capturing um, the, the, the seasonal uh, variability that we see with our measurements. Now, of course, that shouldn't be that big of a surprise, right? I mean, they, they used our data um, from these sites, and so you would hope that they match up one to one. Um, so let's take a look at, at another site. So this is Illinois. Um, at mid-latitudes, uh, they used the, the data that we had collected from Perry in, in North Carolina. So Illinois is a little bit further away, um, so this could be used, seen as a validation. And you can see from 93, to 07, again, we see that 07 seems to have done something weird with some of the, the tidal structures, probably. Um, but when we go back to HWM 14, we see it actually looks pretty good. Uh, I, I'd say all the major structure that you would want to see from a climatological model, um, at least, is, is captured correctly. Um, the, real, the real challenge then goes into comparing to Morocco. So there was no real ground-based data that went into the HWM formulation from, from Africa. Um, and if we look at HWM 14 and compare the Moroccan zonal winds and meridional winds to what you get out of HWM 14, I'd say by and large it's doing a pretty good job. Um, so I think I think HWM 14 is in is, is in pretty good step, uh, pretty good shape right now for providing things that a climatological model should be providing. It doesn't get you to the day-to-day -day variability, which you can see there is quite a bit of day-to-day -day variability in the winds. Um, but in terms of providing the growth structure um, that you would hope a climatological model will provide, I think HWM14 is doing a good job. Okay, let's move on to uh, another topic. Um, 
so as we started putting out these, these, these networks um, of, of, of observations, it became very clear that we had to think up of a, a, a different way to actually analyze and make use of the data. Um, so this is, this is the uh, nation uh, network. So the, the red symbols show you where each of the individual observatories are. And then if we're in our normal cardinal mode observing geometry, uh, observation strategy, sorry, where you look to the north, east, south, west, and vertical, uh, these gray symbols show you where our, our measurements are being made from. Um, so you can see we cover about uh, 12 degrees in latitude and maybe uh, 15 degrees in longitude. So we, we have a lot of spatial um, coverage from this network. And if you just want to look at these measurements as single observations, you can create a stack plot like these, this. Um, so this, each of the different colors is a different um, observatory, Ann Arbor, Illinois, uh, Eastern Kentucky, and then Perry, um, or Virginia Tech is hiding back behind here, um, and they're offset. So um, each of these lines is referenced to an individual zero here, just so we can sort of uh, put everything on the same plot. Um, and so these are the zonal winds looking to the east. These are the meridional winds looking to the north. These are the meridional winds looking to the south. The zonals looking to the west. And these are zenith observations looking um, vertically. Um, and so you can see, OK, yeah, uh, you can see trends here, right? And, but that's not really exciting or isn't taking, making use of all the information we have. We needed to come up with some way where we would actually use all this information and come up with, hopefully, a, a wind field over the entire region, not just the, these individual line measurements. Because if you're just going to look at each of these instruments as an individual instrument, why put them all out together, right? We want to be able to jointly invert all that information. Um, so again, leveraging work done by one of my students, um, if, if we take each of these individual measurements, it's a projection of the, the, the three-dimensional wind vector in terms of um, zonal, meridional, and vertical winds uh, beating against the, the uh, look directions, the, uh, the zenith angle and the azimuth angle. And so we can stack, stack all these observations up um, and put and, and presuppose an unknown wind field at some grid. And then we have an observation matrix which converts from one to the other. The real challenge is that A, this, this A matrix here, our observation matrix, is severely, uh, is, is quite uh, underdeterm underdetermined. It's a very sparse matrix. Uh, if we want to invert the, the wind field, so the, the U, the zonal, meridional, and vertical wind at each point in that wind field, we don't have enough measurements. Um, so you have to come up with uh, an, uh, some way to smooth or regularize the field. So at least in this initial uh, paper, what we, what we did is to look to um, minimize the, the, the gradients, the first derivative and the second derivatives of the vector wind field. Um, and then if you, if you regularize in that way, you can actually come up with an inversion for this matrix, which makes some sense. Um, and so based upon your measurements, your observing geometry, and your constraints, you can come up with an estimate of what the uh, three-dimensional wind field is um, over a large region. Um, as an example, this is from our two-site network in Brazil. So we have our observatories here making observations in this region. Um, and you put all those observations into that matrix equation. You turn the crank, and you come up with a wind field. Um, and you can then visualize that wind field over time. And so you can see in this example, you get uh, wind flowing towards the northeast. Um, uh, over time, you start to see some, uh, some changes. What you'll eventually see is that there's some convergence of the wind here where, here we go, we have some convergence of the wind field over the site at this time before it goes back to being primarily towards the north and the northeast. Um, but by having these networks of instruments out there um, and, and analyzing it with this sort of methodology, you can go from looking at single points in the sky to actually trying to estimate and understand what's going on over a, over a wider spatial domain, uh, which can be actually very illuminating um, to understand the physics. So in this case, what we see, um, these are frames from individual frames from that movie. Um, where the background col color is actually an estimate of what the vertical wind is. And you can see it at this time, around 2.15 2 or so, here we had a slight convergence of the wind. Um, 
And because we actually have an estimate of the entire wind field, we can actually calculate what that divergence is. Because at every point in, in space, we know what the, we have an estimate of what the zonal wind is and what the meridional wind is at all points x and y, x and y, right? Um, and so we can, we can plot a metric of what the divergence here. And so we, we have this convergence um, around 2 o'clock. And then here, on, uh, the other colors are all the estimates of the temperature that we have from this network. And you can see uh, this is the phenomena that, that's been talked about for quite a while, uh, the midnight temperature maximum. And we can see that the MTM, midnight temperature maximum, occurs uh, coincident in time uh, with this uh, convergence of the wind. And actually, we, we, we've looked, um, and, and, and pretty much all the cases that we've looked at, we, we see some sort of a convergence uh, co-located in space and time with, with the MTMs. Um, and so that starts to give you some, some idea of the sorts of scientific studies you can do once you have this sort of a wind field map um, at your fingertips. You can start to look at convergence, divergence, um, and, and really test some of those, those theories about what's causing uh, these structures that we've been observing from single sites. Um, for, for decades. So then the, the other thing that I'll talk about here, this is uh, what John had alluded to in the introduction with the paper that we published last year, uh, was to look at uh, the response of the thermosphere during geomagnetic storms. Um, and having developed all the analysis techniques, the, the mapping strategy, we were in a pretty good, um, uh, pretty good place to, to, to tackle this problem. Um, so to give you a sense of what, what we're looking at at storm times, um, this is an example from uh, September 2013, um, and this is what I would call as, as a normal, typical um, mid-latitude uh, neutral wind field. Uh, so at this time of the year, we see over Virginia Tech, we see a slight southward wind reaching maybe 100 meters per second around local midnight or so. Uh, the zonal wind is predominantly eastward in the early evening, maybe reaching 75 meters per second or so uh, before uh, turning westward um, in, in, in the uh, local morning hours. Um, in contrast, the, the day after this, there was not really a major storm, I would say. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything spectacular. Uh, it wasn't a Halloween storm or anything like that. We had the DST reach maybe minus 80 nanotesla. KP got up very briefly to 8 minus. Um, so, so there was something. But if we see the response of the thermosphere as measured from, by the interferometers, um, this is what we get. So the, the, we see a very strong southward wind. Um, uh, the traditional way to think about this is as the high latitudes are heated, you're going to get uh, pressure and, and, and you're going to get uh, winds flowing t away from that heat towards the south. And we can see very strong winds reaching 400, 500 meter second, meters per second to the south. Um, and then the, uh, the zonal winds react to that through the Coriolis force, and they switch from the typical eastward, they, they rotate, and they, they reach westward speeds of maybe 100 meters per second or so towards the west during this time. Um, and that, that fit into traditionally what we thought the thermosphere was doing. Um, this, this really wasn't that uh, surprising to see. It was, it was nice to see that our, our data are, are, were high enough quality to see these sorts of things, but it, it wasn't terribly surprising. Uh, we can run the observations through this wind field mapping, um, and so this is what we see. Uh, the storm starts around uh, 2.30 or 3 o'clock universal time, uh, but so this would be your typical wind field at, at mid-latitudes. Uh, but you see as the storm uh, commences, you see this strong uh, flow of air away from the polar regions towards the south. Um, it intensifies. Um, and maintains itself for several hours as the storm goes on. And then as the storm starts to subside, um, and maybe as we start getting the, the TAD, the traveling atmosphere disturbance coming from the southern hemisphere, we see a reversal in the wind field flowing from uh, the south towards the north now. So we thought that was cool, you know, to be able to visualize it in this way. The difficulty, though, is that now that we had lots of different observations from different sites, different instruments, we, we started to notice some, some oddities in the data. Um, so first, since we have this frequency stabilized laser uh, to give us our zero Doppler reference and characterize the, the, the variability within our instruments, we're able to use our zenith measurements to actually give us an estimate of the vertical neutral wind, which by all accounts should be small. And typically, it would, it's assumed that it's smaller than the uncertainties in your, your measurements, and so you just assume it was zero. So if you don't have a frequency-stabilized laser or some other zero Doppler source, you would use your zenith measurement 
measurements as your zero reference. Um, but now that we have these frequency stabilized lasers and routine observations of them, we can look towards the zenith and actually come up with an estimate of what the vertical neutral wind is. Um, so on this day, this is what we get. So this is the same storm day, and this is our, our measurement from um, one of the sites, I think it's probably uh, Illinois. And you can see, yeah, in the early evening it's zero, but then as the storm comes on, we start to see these ridiculously large winds coming down at us. Um, 150 meters per second at, at its peak, and very long duration, six hours long. Uh, so you, it's difficult to imagine the thermosphere coming down at you for, for six hours at 100 meters per second. So it's very difficult. So okay, if I didn't know better, I would just say my instrument is broken. Okay, something, something is wrong, because usually when I look at it, these are the other observations from that week, uh, the, from that same instrument, and the, the zenith, the vertical neutral winds are, are negligible. Okay, so something must have gone wrong with my instrument on this day. And, and if you look through the historical, historical record data, shoot, the instruments always break during storms. We always see, you know, you can see this sort of effect there. So that's not quite good. The advantage of the network is we have five sites that have instruments. They're in different uh, environmental conditions. They're observing different regions of the sky. And so if we stack up our, vertic our zenith look directions for all of those sites, all of those sites are seeing similar trends in the vertical, the, the vertical neutral winds. Okay, so I can't explain this away as an instrumental effect. And then I go talk to John Noto and, and, and take a look at his data from Millstone Hill, and it's a different instrument, different etalon gap size, different analysis technique, and they're still seeing a similar type of uh, trend in when they look towards the zenith. So I can't, I can't, I can't wash this away as an instrumental effect. This has to be something going on in the region of the sky that we're looking at. It has to be, it has to be real. So then the question becomes, what, what, what's going on? Um, we, have other, we have other weird things when we look at the data from a network standpoint. Um, so we, we made this uh, deployment of, of, of instruments in this, in this geometry, uh, not only because we had friends at all the universities that we were working with, um, so that made the deployment easier, but also because it gave us the, the opportunity to, to observe the same region of the sky from different sites. Um, so we can do these common volume type measurements. Um, so in this example, if you look from our site, um, Aaron Ridley's site up in Ann Arbor, if you look to the south, and then you take this uh, measurements looking to the north from our eastern Kentucky site, uh, you're observing the same point in the sky. And on this night, the temperatures estimated from those two instruments um, at this time where we have these large vertical winds in our, in, our, in our estimates, they're off by about 300 or 400 Kelvin. You kind of typical day, those, those will agree within maybe 20 or 30 Kelvin or so. Um, so again, there's some anisotropy in the temperature estimates where we're getting some, some different estimated, estimated temperature depending on how we're looking at the thermosphere, from what direction. Uh, other discrepancies. So again, if, if you have a wind field that's moving over you in some way, if you observe it looking to the south and you observe it looking to the north, they should be equal and opposite. Uh, if we take a look at our north look directions and our south look directions, these don't look equal and opposite. Right here at Ann Arbor, or let's, let's look at uh, UAO. So Illinois, which uh, the north observations occurred about 40 degrees north. Uh, we see zero, zero uh, wind uh, looking when we look to the north, and then we see this large uh, decrease in the wind looking in that direction. If we use the Ann Arbor looking to the south, early on they seem to agree, but rather than turning further southward, we see something moving in the opposite direction. So the, again, there's some non-uniformity in the wind field as well, depending on how we look at it. Um, we can also take a look in the south and the zenith look directions, we see this pulse in, in the uh, wind field and we, as we look in those directions, which we don't really see when we look to the north. Maybe there's a little bit of an inkling of it here. Um, but there's this pulse at 430. Um, that, that also has some, uh, some latitudinal dependence in it, where it's much larger here when we're at the northern latitudes than we are here five degrees to the south. All right, so we, we went and we looked to see what other sorts of observations we could find. Again, our friends at Millstone Hill are running a, a red line imager, um, and so what you can see on this night um, is a general increase in the red line emission as well as that SAR arc, the stable auroral red arc. 
and it actually that star arc passes over and moves towards the south right at the time as we're getting that pulse um, in the winds as we're looking in the south and the, the vertical look direction. Um, I talked with Gary Bust, who ran his IDA 4D, and uh, to come up with the three-dimensional volume uh, of the electron density. This is a cut of latitude and altitude, and you can see at this time that there's some anomalous distribution of the plasma that he's estimating from his IDA 4D technique. Um, at this period. So, so clearly there's something, there's, there are other physics than just the traditional thermospheric dynamics going on um, during this period um, that are leading to these, these, these interesting measurements. Um, and we started thinking about what, what could be causing this, and we came down to, to the, the fact that we, we can't be only measuring a thermalized thermospheric population of, of photons. There has to be some component within that spectra that we're measuring that isn't indicative of the thermospheric motion. Um, and, and one of the candidates was this uh, hot oxygen or fast oxygen um, population that could be coming in um, at low energies um, from O plus precipitation. Uh, we, we took a look at the, uh, the RB SPICE uh, HOPE instruments on the Van Allen probes, and so this is our O plus flux. And uh, you can see um, uh, around this time, 2 to 6 p.m., we can see in the O plus an increase in the, the oxygen, uh, the flux density. Just as a reference, this is what the O plus would look like on a quiet day. So there's clearly some increase in the flux density. Um, and actually, as you go back and you look through the various storms that we've captured over the past three years with the Nation Network, um, during these periods, period, uh, periods where we have this apparent downward wind in our measurements, uh, inevitably we see an increase in the O plus uh, precipitation. Okay, so you go back and you look at the literature and actually, you know, hot O, these sorts of things, they've been in the literature for quite a while. Um, and actually, if you look at a lot of the simulations that have been done by um, Sippler, um, Shamatovich, uh, and, and the like, uh, they, they are all looking at the thermal effects of this, of this population, not really considering what the effect would be on a measured Doppler velocity from an interferometer. Um, so Tor et al. back in, way back in 74, I wasn't even born, boy, um, suggested that you could have from this precipitation O+, plus, you could have charge and momentum exchange, which would produce fast oxygen. Um, and then those oxygen atoms uh, would be in an excited state, and as uh, they would eventually, or could eventually emit a red line photon. Um, and depending on what altitude that charge and momentum exchange occurred, where that hot uh, or fast oxygen was generated, it may not have enough time uh, or may not have enough collisions to thermalize completely before it emits that red line photon. So that red line photon is no longer representative of the thermalized background. Um, it's representative of some, some mixture of the background and the energetics of the precipitating O+. Um, and Ishimoto actually did a nice uh, simulation uh, where they worked it all the way through and found that this could produce Doppler shifted photons on the order of 500 to 7 kilometers per second, um, which they then concluded that was negligible because they were talking about higher speeds, of course, whereas for us in the thermosphere, 500 to 7 kilometers per second is massive. Okay, so um, we think that this, this fast oxygen population, uh, these photons, could be contaminating our typical thermospheric background uh, profile. And uh, I'll show you this in a moment. Um, so essentially the idea would be that uh, here are the, the, the field lines uh, and the fast O population would, could have some uh, predominantly field line emotion. So you'd have your background thermosphere you have your field, possibly field-aligned motion um, indicative of this fast oxygen population. Um, and then depending on whether you're observing it from this direction or that direction, you're going to get some anisotropies in the temperature measurements and the wind measurements. Uh, just to convince you that that could be possible, um, I, I've, I'm simulating next a, a thermospheric uh, motion, uh, maybe of 400 meters per second uh, with a temperature of 900 Kelvin. Um, and then some contamination moving along the field line with 600 meters per second, so it fits within that Ishimoto um, hypothesis with uh, some hot components, so 2,000 Kelvin or so. Um, and I'm simulating what we would see uh, looking uh, to the north, so like uh, along that direction uh, to the south, 
and vertically. Okay? And if you were just looking at the thermospheric population, that is what we would see um, from those three look directions. If we add in the contaminate population, um, we would get uh, different Doppler shifts. Um, so you would have uh, populations that would look like that, and really what the interferometer would see would be the sum of those two. Um, and so this is what differs a little bit from, from the preliminary, or the earlier work that was done, uh, where the Doppler shifts weren't considered. All, all that was considered was you had your thermospheric population and you had an underlying hot population at the same velocity. But actually, if you have a population moving at a different, uh, different velocity, you're going to get some different effects here. Um, not knowing any better, though, I'm going to analyze that um, combination, so this red profile, as if it were a single Gaussian. And so I would get estimates of the velocity looking to the north of about minus 200 meters per second. Looking to the, and if I look at what we actually see in the data, we see uh, from this reference line um, on the order of 250 meters per second or so. So that, that could fit. Uh, if we look to the vertical, we get uh, a slightly smaller number, 150 meters per second. And again, if I look at that, uh, that uh, difference there from the zero line, it's about 150 meters per second. And then if I look to the south, I get essentially a zero uh, wind, which again is what I see in the measurements as well. So if we consider these two populations, that can explain the anisotropies I see in the wind fields. How about the temperature fields? So looking to the north, uh, through the simulation, I have a temperature of about 1,200 Kelvin and about 1,500 Kelvin looking to the south. And again, that, that matches at least uh, the, the measurement size, I, I'm saying. I'm not saying these numbers are correct, uh, the populations I chose. I just chose those populations to, to illustrate that having this contamination in the spectral measurement can lead to all of the different facets of the data that we've seen. And so the challenge really becomes, you know, is there a way to, to invert this contaminated profile to come up with estimates of what those two populations are? Um, if we can, that, that's exciting because it can tell us something about the precipitation uh, from the inner magnetosphere and its coupling all the way down into the, into the thermosphere. Um, it's difficult, though. You have, you have essentially six degrees of freedom. You don't know what the temperature of the uh, thermosphere is, its velocity, or its intensity, relative intensity, to this contaminating population. And depending on all those parameters, here I'm just, I'm just cranking up the intensity of the contamination, and you can change your temperature, your velocity, to be almost anything that you want it, want it to be. So you have, you have a lot of degrees of freedom here, and the, the, the question is going to become, can we constrain it using these networks of observations where we're observing from different look directions so that we can come up with an estimate of what these two populations are? Okay, so what do we do now? Um, so I think I've shown the, the, the number of Fabi Pros that are out there now um, are significantly more than there were about a, de a decade ago. Um, and uh, there have been several reasons for, for putting those out there and, and why this, is, this last decade has been so useful in terms of uh, putting these instruments out, driven a lot by the improved sensing technologies and, and improvements in signal processing. Um, but the question becomes, well, at, during these storms, what can we do? Right? And, and it was really a conversation we had amongst our group as we started discovering this. It, it sort of makes the argument that these interferometers aren't useful during the time when you want them to be useful. But this is sort of the problem you get with GPS as well, right? I mean, the GPS measurements of equatorial bubbles are contaminated by scintillation effects. So you can't do TEC. It's, it's the same. Anthea's going, Meh. She doesn't agree with that statement. But you know, there's, there, there, there are other things you can do, and, and, and you're not always in this state. Maybe 10%, 10, 12% of the time, you have these storm time effects. Um, but I think the exciting thing is combining with other sorts of measurements, uh, we might be able to turn this on its ear, and this contamination actually becomes some signature of the latitudinal or longitud longitudinal distribution of the precipitation, uh, precipitating O plus that you're only getting in situ measurements or imaging from, from space. Um, so as an example, uh, this is comparison to twins. So these are their low altitude emissions. Their low altitude is our normal altitude. Um, and so you can see you're getting these energetic neutral atoms uh, increase of these uh, ENAs 
um, and this is an index of that, uh, of that low altitude emission index. And during these periods where we see these apparent vertical winds are also times where they're seeing these energetic neutrals. So we may be seeing another facet of, these, of this ENA production, or it could just be that whatever is producing ENAs and whatever is causing our downward winds occur during storms, and so they're temporally coincident. They may not be causative in nature, but that's something that we're looking at, um, and Brian is going to talk about that in his poster, which I encourage you to take a look at. All right, so the other things that we're, 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 we're thinking about for the future is, again, going back to the models and, and what density of measurements do, do the modelers need to really understand the uh, spatial and temporal variability, uh, what spatial scales are important. Um, and then, of course, what I'm excited about is uh, the data quality and the instruments, uh, instrumentation is good enough now that I think we can really start thinking about ingesting these measurements uh, at least during non-contaminated times for the time being, into assimilative models. And so these assimilative models will now be driven by measurements of the neutrals as well as all the plasma parameters that they're getting from radars and in-situ measurements and GPS. Um, and I think that would be a major step forward. Um, and then finally, I'll just end by saying I, I think a continental scale or larger network is really feasible these days. Maybe not financially, but who knows. Uh, technologically, we can definitely do it. Um, and so this is a dream to be able to have enough instruments out there to be able to measure the neutral wind field at high enough spatial and temporal cadences to really be able to see uh, the, the response of the thermosphere during different stress conditions as well as its day-to-day its, as its -day variability. Thank you. So we're going to wrap up this, and uh, I, maybe John could uh, come up for a moment. John Merriweather. We're going. Um, we'd like to present John Macalo with a, uh, a plaque on behalf of the Cedar Science Steering Committee for uh, his uh, victory in winning the 2015 Cedar Prize lecture and uh, giving an excellent talk. So, thank you.